So a senior national public radio or NPR editor of 25 years has now been suspended without pay for writing a scathing op-ed about the deep left-wing bias of his news organization. NPR suspended the senior business editor Yuri Berliner for five days without pay following this publication of a scathing op-ed in the free press, where he criticized the organization for its progressive leanings and lack of viewpoint diversity. This suspension, which began last Friday, was due to Berliner's failure to secure approval for external work, a requirement for NPR journalists. Now, the reactions you can imagine were swift and critical. Internally, many of the NPR staff expressed feelings of betrayal, accusing Yuri of cherry-picking examples and undermining trust within the newsroom. Outside NPR, though, the op-ed attracted a lot of attention from conservative figures and media outlets, with many calling for the defunding of NPR. This includes former President Donald Trump, who labeled NPR as a liberal disinformation machine and advocated for cutting its funding. Now, in response to the backlash, NPR's president and CEO, Catherine Mayer, announced the implementation of a monthly and quarterly meetings to review coverage and ensure it reflects the diversity of the country. These meetings aim to address concerns about NPR's editorial direction and restore trust among its audience. Now, I don't know about you, but a sudden change of heart seems highly unlikely from the head of this organization, but I guess anything's possible, right? So what exactly did Yuri write in his op-ed that was so offensive to the NPR organization? I'm going to read to you some excerpts from the article itself. So this is Yuri. We're in the middle of the article here, and he writes, For decades, since its founding in 1970, a wide swath of America tuned in to NPR for reliable journalism and gorgeous audio pieces with birds singing in the Amazon. Millions came to us for conversations that exposed us to voices around the country and the world radically different from our own, engaging precisely because they were unguarded and unpredictable. Back in 2011, although NPR's audience tilted a bit to the left, a bit to the left, so that's, uh, that's a bit of a stretch, but okay, it still bore a resemblance to America at large. 26% of listeners described themselves as conservative, 23% as middle of the road, and 37% as liberal. By 2023, though, the picture was completely different. Only 11% described themselves as very or somewhat conservative, 21% as middle of the road, and 67% of listeners said they were very or somewhat liberal. We weren't just losing conservatives, we were also losing moderates and traditional liberals. An open-minded spirit, Yuri wrote, no longer exists within NPR, and now, predictably, we don't have an audience that reflects America. Like many unfortunate things, the rise of advocacy took off with Donald Trump, as in many newsrooms. His election in 2016 was greeted at NPR with a mixture of disbelief, anger, and despair. Just to note, I eagerly voted against Trump twice, but felt we were obliged to cover him fairly. But what began as tough, straightforward coverage of a belligerent, truth-impaired president veered towards efforts to damage or topple Trump's presidency. And they weren't alone here, my friends. This was a common theme from all these news networks. Um, the vast majority of news networks uh, here in the U.S. were out and out anti-Trump. In fact, I want to pull up this New York Times article, Jim Rutenberg. He discussed the challenges of maintaining traditional journalistic objectivity in the coverage of Donald Trump. And he suggested that the unprecedented nature of Trump's campaign and presidency might just justify a departure from unbiased reporting. He argued that because Trump was such an orange man bad... Um, and because he was so rude and he was politically incorrect uh, that, you know, and, and the way he conducted his campaign was not normal. That why it was it was too much of a challenge for modern day journalism. He thought that journalism's duty is to be true to the readers and viewers and true to the facts in a way that will stand up to history's judgment, even if it might not always seem fair to Trump or his supporters. Which is just a nice way of saying, let's just do some propaganda here and tell you what, how we feel about it, not precisely what is, what is the truth. And that's really what happened to all of the news networks. That's why the idea of fake news became such a ubiquitous thing in our culture is because, to be frank, um, nobody really trusts the media to be telling them the truth anymore. And unfortunately, this opened the door for the new media to come in. This is your social media or quote, your so-called influencers or content creators. This was the game changer here. Now, let me continue with his article here. He said, persistent rumors that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia over the election became the catnip that drove reporting. 
At NPR, we hitched our wagon to Trump's most visible antagonist, Representative Adam Schiff. And as I covered in a recent episode, we're talking about the biggest liar in all of Congress. This was the man that NPR, along with a lot of other networks, glommed onto. Anyway, he continues to write here that Schiff, who was the top Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, became NPR's guiding hand. It's ever-present muse. By my count, Yuri says, NPR hosts interviewed Schiff 25 times about Trump and Russia. During many of these conversations, Schiff alluded to purported evidence of collusion, which, again, he was out and out lying, saying, I've seen the evidence, blah, 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 trust me. And of course, there was none. Anyway, Yuri writes, the Schiff talking points became the drumbeat of NPR news reports. And I would also add all other news networks out there. But then he writes, but when the Mueller report found no credible evidence of collusion, NPR's coverage was notably sparse. Russiagate quietly faded from our programming, as did most news networks, by the way. Anyway, Yuri goes on to write, he says, it is one thing to swing and miss on a major story. Unfortunately, it happens. You follow the wrong leads. You get misled by sources you trusted. You're emotionally invested in a narrative and bits of circumstantial evidence never add up. It is bad to blow a big story. What's worse, though, is to pretend it never happened, to move on with no mea culpas, no self-reflection, especially when you expect high standards of transparency from public figures and institutions, but don't practice those standards yourself. That's what shatters trust and engenders cynicism about the media. Yeah. They didn't care about what was factual, what was true. It was get Trump, get Trump, get Trump, orange man, bad, whatever you had to say and do to get rid of him because he was a bad person. So the end justifies the means, even if you're making stuff up or even if you're reporting on news that is fake. Anyway, Yuri goes on to write that in October 2020, the New York Post published the explosive report about the laptop Hunter Biden abandoned at a Delaware computer shop containing emails about assorted business dealings. With the elections only weeks away, NPR turned a blind eye, and so, by the way, did all other news media outlets. Except maybe, I, I think Fox might have recovered it a little bit there. And then, anyway, Yuri goes on to write, here's how NPR's managing editor for News at the Time explained the thinking. He said, we don't want to waste our time on stories that are not really stories, and we don't want to waste the listeners' and readers' time on stories that are just pure distractions. But it wasn't a pure distraction. Yuri writes, or a product of Russian disinformation, as dozens of former and current intelligence officials suggested. Which, by the way, I want to point out that these people need to be investigated. These former and current intelligence officials, they were straight up lying to the American people. They knew what they were doing. This was all about get Trump, get Trump. Anyway, Yuri goes on to write that the laptop did belong to Hunter Biden, as we all know now. Its contents revealed his connection to the corrupt world of multi-million dollar influence peddling and its possible implications for his father. The laptop was newsworthy. But the timeless journalistic instinct of following a hot story lead had been squelched. During a meeting with colleagues, I listened as one of the NPR's best and most fair-minded journalists said it was good we weren't following the laptop story because it could help Trump. Now that should tell you everything you need to know. So much for fair-minded journalists. What a, what a piece of garbage here. Uh, anyway, Yuri goes on to write that when the essential facts of the Post reporting were confirmed and the emails verified independently about a year and a half later, we could have fessed up about our misjudgment. Now, he's being really nice here. I would say purposeful uh, exclusion of the news. Now, Yuri would go on to talk about a new direction for NPR, where in the wake of George Floyd's death, NPR faced a critical question. Does systemic racism pervade America in areas like law enforcement, education and housing? And he talked about that instead of pursuing an investigative approach, NPR's leadership under Lansing took a definitive stance where they decided that, yep, systemic racism is the reason. And then decided that NPR would be an organization for change. Lansing's message, Yuri would write, was clear. NPR itself needed to confront it and address its own biases and privileges. He emphasized diversity as the organization's North Star, leading to significant changes in workplace culture at NPR. And this, by the way, would then lead to the DEI initiatives that NPR would be infected with by. That's, of course, the diversity, equity and inclusion. They started focusing on unconscious bias training and the establishment of a centralized tracking system for the race, gender and ethnicity of interview subjects. And this would inevitably lead to NPR's transformation where they started having formation of employee resource groups based on identity um, and gender. These groups aimed to provide support and foster a sense of inclusion among the staff, Yuri would write. And he would say, though, that their role extended beyond mere networking. 
influencing NPR's union, SAG-AFTRA, to prioritize DEI and collective bargaining and news coverage, language, and style. Yuri would write that this shift towards a progressive worldview with its inclusivity and systemic issues. He felt raised concerns about the lack of viewpoint diversity within NPR. Well, no, duh, right? The focus on identity and advocacy led to a homogenization of perspectives. He wrote that for nearly all of his career, working at NPR has been a source of great pride. It was his privilege to work in the newsroom. He said, I can't count the number of times I would meet someone and describe what I do. And they'd say, I love NPR. But he says now, though, the trajectory of the conversation is different. While they still get the I love NPR, there's a pause and a person will acknowledge that I don't listen as much as I used to or what's happening there. Why is NPR telling me what to think? Now, Yuri would write that in recent years, he'd struggled to answer that very question, concerned by the lack of viewpoint diversity. He looked at voter registration from the newsroom. In D.C., where NPR was headquartered and many of them live, Yuri wrote, I found the 87 registered Democrats working in editorial positions and zero Republicans. None. So on May 3rd, 2021, I presented the findings at an all-hands editorial staff meeting. And when I suggested we had a diversity problem with a score of 87 Democrats and zero Republicans, the response wasn't hostile. It was worse. It was met with profound indifference. I got a few messages from surprised, curious colleagues, but the messages were all of the, oh, wow, that's weird variety, as if the lopsided tally was a random anomaly rather than a critical failure of our diversity North Star. In a follow-up email exchange, a top NPR News executive told me that she had been skewered for bringing up diversity of thought when she arrived at NPR, so she said, I want to be careful how we discuss this publicly. For years, Yuri wrote, I have been persistent when I believe our coverage has gone off the rails. I have written regular emails to top news leaders, sometimes even having one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. On March 10th, 2022, I wrote at, to a top news executive about the numerous times we described the controversial education bill in Florida as the don't say gay bill when it didn't even use the word gay. I pushed it to set the record straight and wrote another time to ask why we keep using that word that many Hispanics hate, Latinx or otherwise known as Latinx. On March 31st, 2022, I was invited to a manager's meeting to present my observations. Throughout these exchanges, no one has ever trashed me. That's not the NPR way. People are polite, but nothing changes. So I've become a visible wrong thinker at a place that I love. It's uncomfortable, sometimes heartbreaking. Even so, out of frustration, on November 6, 2022, I wrote to the captain of ship North Star CEO John Lansing about the lack of viewpoint diversity and asked if we could have a conversation about it. I got no response, so I followed up four days later. He said he would appreciate hearing my perspective and copied his assistant to set up a meeting. On December 15th, the morning of the meeting, Lansing's assistant wrote back to cancel our conversation because he was under the weather. She said he was looking forward to chatting and a new meeting invitation would be sent, but it never came. Now, my friends, if you want to read this article in its entirety, which I would recommend, I'll put a link to the article in the description below. That being said, though, I don't really find this all that shocking, except for the fact that it's finally being said from within, publicly, right? This, to me, though, is a signal of a crack in the dam. The radical left progressives, the ones that bow to the Marxist, socialist, communist ideology, those who hate white people or have self-white guilt and who otherwise subscribe to hate think, have managed to infest and infect almost every major news outlet, film studio, and AAA gaming companies these days. And I think it's reaching a point where those that work within that are leftists but aren't lunatics are finding it almost impossible to maintain the status quo. So things are starting to leak out there. This infestation, my friends, of social and political rot it's been festering under the surface for a long, long, long time now, and it appears that it can no longer be contained in the darkness. People like Yuri at NPR and others like him, with their willingness to actually speak about this big problem that's happening underneath the surface, is causing to help accelerate the American people at large to slowly yet surely become fully aware of how twisted and perverse these people have really become. NPR's fall was always bound to happen. You, you can't engage in this kind of crazy ideology and not expect it to go off the rails at some point. The modern left has been completely co-opted by this infection. Radical leftists demand one think. Radical progressives demand a hive mind of obedience. They have no tolerance for even the slightest trace of resistance. 
And because of this, they crush the classic liberals, the classic leftists and moderates. They are being forced, these moderates and classic liberals, to either bow to the new think or else. This crazy ideology that has infected places like NPR has become a cancer on our culture, our society at large. This is untenable for an America with a future. A country that can disagree on fundamental issues but hash it out at the ballot box with the knowledge that there is always a next time if you don't win, if things don't go your way. That's crucial for any society to survive with. And right now, here in the U.S., it is fast becoming a dream of better days.